Four weeks ago, we started a new series entitled Redefining Freedom. Um, it's a study of the New Testament book of Philippians, <clears throat> written by the Apostle Paul to the believers <clears throat> pardon me, in the city of Philippi. That's why the book is called The Philippians. It's only four chapters long, <clears throat> um, so it's not a very lengthy book. But it's absolutely packed with spiritual insight, a practical teaching, and personal life challenges. So far, Paul has encouraged us to, to become the saints that we already are in Christ. Then he talks about the difficult question of suffering. And because he's addressing believers, rather than trying to answer the question why there is suffering, um, is encouraging believers to to look at how bad things happen and then how do they respond to that. Then he concluded the, the section of the, uh, the statement that he made with those words that we know so well. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. <clears throat> then he talks about the church and the mission of the church. And the statement that he makes is so simple yet so incredibly profound. It says that to us who claim to be believers, the church is not about you. It's about that person who still needs to come to faith. And then he, to illustrate that, he brings the if-then statement. And now this applies to our Christian life, uh, along with the importance and the, the mystery of the Trinity, the power of unity, and the importance of humility in our lives. So that's the summary of what we have done so far. And if you missed any of the messages, or you simply want to listen to them again, and remember, they are available on our YouTube channel, Spotify, and all our other social media. <clears throat> so far, so good. Okay? What comes next? Well, let's find out. Philippians chapter 2, looking at verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. <clears throat> now, let's stop here for a second. And before we unpack what these two verses uh, mean, let's unpack what they don't mean. Because here is an important concept that we need to understand, that we need to consider. The term... Work out your salvation. <clears throat> now, these two verses have caused a lot of people to think that you have to do something to earn your salvation. If I am a good person, well, I might be good enough to be saved. If I obey the Ten Commandments, then I might just do enough to be saved. If I read the Bible every day, if I pray, if I go to church, and even if I give financially to the church, I might just be able to earn my way to heaven. But that's not what Paul is saying here. The idea of working out your salvation has nothing to do with working for your salvation. Working for your salvation is a totally worldview in some ways. It's so different from what Christianity says. Working for your, for your salvation is having to earn it, it's, it's to merit, to deserve it. And yes, lots of religions in our world teach precisely that. You have to earn, you have to work, um, you have to do something to gain your way to heaven. Not so with Christianity. The Christian faith is so radically different from such a view. There was a, a, a conference, a British conference, in the 19, early 1960s, um, which brought students and scholars from all parts of the world to discuss was anything different about Christianity from other world religions? Um, was it the idea that God became a man? No other religions have variations of that one. Even the Greek and Roman religions um, were all about God's appearing in human form. Was it heaven? Was it life after death? Was it eternal soul? Was it love for your neighbor, good works? Um, was it care for the poor, the homeless? Was it about sin and, and hell and judgment? Uh, no, because this is common to so many world religions. And this debate went on for some time until C.S. Lewis 
uh, wondered, walked into the room, and he asked his colleagues, what are you folks debating? And they, they, don't, they told him, we, we're kind of trying to discuss what is Christianity's contribution that is different from everything else in the world. And C.S. Lewis said, oh, that's easy. It's grace. And after that, thought for a couple of seconds, said, yeah, it is grace. On most every other religion on our planet, among them all, Christianity is the only one that is not based on works, but grace. In fact, the Bible goes a long way to make this clear. Take a look at what Paul wrote in another one of his letters found in Ephesians. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not doing of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The best simple definition of grace is that it is freely given, totally undeserved. It's getting what we don't deserve and not getting what we do deserve. So, if salvation is by grace, then what is Paul talking about here in Philippians when he tells us that we are to work out our salvation? He's talking about something which tends to be somewhat overlooked. While salvation is not something that we earn, is not something that we can work for, it is a free gift from God. It doesn't make it a passive exercise in our lives. Our salvation in Christ is not simply a future event or something that happens when we die. If we are Christians, if we are believers, we are saved right now. And that salvation is not simply what happens at the end of our lives, as I just said, but it, it's the working out right now in our lives of what that means to us, or at least what it's supposed to mean to us. If you and I are followers of Christ, we are living a saved life, and that saved life carries some obligations. So working out our salvation does not mean working for it, but it does mean working with it. You see, we can't unleash the power of prayer without praying. We cannot be guided by the truth of Scripture unless we apply those principles to our lives. We can't be filled with the presence of God unless we look for it. We cannot be challenged by godly men and women unless we allow them to challenge us. We cannot have a heart for the poor apart from serving the poor. And as men, we cannot be men of God, the men that he called us to be as husbands, as, as fathers, as leaders, unless we are prepared to live by God's guidance for us. We cannot be filled with the Spirit if we keep on negating His power in our lives. And we cannot demonstrate a life of love and, and joy and peace and patience and kindness and all the other fruits that we find if we are engaging in a life of sexual immorality, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition and envy. And what Paul is doing in this letter is to write about the expression of our salvation, how that is seen in our day-to-day -day living. Seen in the way that we grow spiritually, see in the way that we mature spiritually. Salvation isn't just a gift or an event, but it's something which is alive, which is dynamic. It touches every part of our lives. That is God's not just to save us in the future, but to have salvation begin its work, its transformational work right now. We are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. We are saved if we come to Jesus Christ as our Savior. We will be saved at the great judgment at the end of time, but in between, we are being saved. And it is the being saved part that Paul is writing about. But if that is so, then why does Paul say that we are to pursue our salvation with fear and trembling? I think it reminds us to take our salvation seriously. Our salvation should be seen in the light of the seriousness and the reality of our sin and the depth of God's abundant grace, mercy, and forgiveness. 
In other words, let's not look at salvation as something which is old news, normal news. Come to your salvation with fear and trembling because you realize the seriousness of, it is, of what it is. And if we look more at Paul's um, writings, we find him addressing this topic time and time again. For instance, look at Romans, Romans chapter 6. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we would join with Christ Jesus in baptism, we would join him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of his Father, the Father, now we also may live new lives. See, Paul was correcting a problem in the church of Rome. People were thinking, well, if I sin, it means I need forgiveness, and I find that forgiveness in grace, then the more I sin, the more grace I get. And Paul responds, what are you thinking? You're missing the point altogether. When we are saved, our lives should change. We became saved, and now we grow through our commitment, through our devotion, and through the deepening of our salvation. And to refuse to try to live this new life that God has given to us in a way to denigrate, to dishonor the cross and everything that Christ did for us in order for us to be saved. So Paul says, in light of that, work out your salvation with proper seriousness, with devotion, with fear and trembling that it deserves. That's why he says in verse 12, prove your devotion with fear and trembling that it deserves. There is more, okay? Look at the second part of verse 12 and then verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, we don't have the power to change our lives. We don't even have a natural desire to do good. But God does. That's his purpose that's his plan for our lives. And while we're becoming more and more like Christ, and that's a natural consequence of our relationship with God, it is not an automatic consequence. The Bible warns us, in, as Paul writes, not to hold back the work of the Holy Spirit by declining, by deciding not to cooperate with what God wants to do in our lives. You see, we can choose to be part of what God is wanting to do in our lives, those promptings, the leadings, the guiding, or we can choose to resist the work that God wants to do in our lives. We can follow in obedience, or we can rebel. But if we choose to be obedient, then we are able to have the honor of being the instrument of God in His greater plans for us, for those around us, and for His kingdom. And that's what we see in these verses as we study Philippians, look at verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud of what I did, I did not run in vain, did not labor in vain. The goal of a worked out salvation is a simple one. In this, as Paul says, crooked, depraved, dark de generation, shine like a star as you hold out the truth, the word of God, and the reality of God. The message that can bring life to that which is dead. If we are followers of Christ, this is what we're working out for. To be light. First and foremost, to reach the lost, a dying world with one and the only message that can transform somebody's eternity. A mission so clear that Jesus, when he spelt it out, it became known as the Great Commission. Go into the old world and preach the message of Christ. But the Great Commission comes also with a cultural commission. 
not only to change the values, to, to, to change the eternal destiny of people, but also to change the values of communities, to work towards the values of the kingdom of God, justice and fairness and compassion for the poor and so on. And let's never think that the changing of a society is beyond us. That is not true. James White was a Christian writer. In one of his books tells of a story that he, of a visit that he made to Moscow shortly um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And one day he was, uh, he was speaking at a church that was filled with capacity, to the capacity. And in the service, um, the front few rows were filled with women wearing scarves, and they were singing with a passion that he described, a passion and an intensity that was so captivating. And through his interpreter, he asked the pastor of the church who these women were. And the reply was, those are the women who prayed and then lived out communism out of Russia. What a statement. In 1994, um, South Africa found itself at the brink of a civil war. With the first democratic uh, elections approaching, there was a very real possibility of war. And in some towns, um, the, tranks, the tanks really rolled down the streets. The church that I was leading at the time was a voting venue. And I still remember so very clearly in my mind, one of those tanks parked in our parking area. Leading up to the elections, um, the church was called to pray to come together and to pray. And Christians did. Christians from every race, from every language, from every cultural background came together to pray. Now, some of you may be familiar with pictures of the Newlands Rugby Stadium in Cape Town. The stadium has a capacity of just over 50,000 people. And a couple of prayer meetings took place in this stadium. And at one of them, the stadium was absolutely, totally full. We now know that against all the expectations, South Africa experienced a peaceful transition to a new government. And this is what Paul is talking about. The kingdom, the values of the kingdom infiltrating society and changing society. That's what the kingdom is supposed to be. But how? When God's people work out their salvation, holding out the message of God's, God's word and shine. In the ancient world, the influence of Christians brought a stop to the killing of infants. It ended slavery, liberated women. It created hospitals and orphanages and schools. During the medieval times, Christianity kept classic culture alive through the copying of manuscripts, the building of libraries, the invention, the establishment of colleges and universities. In our modern era, Christians have led the way in the development of science, political and economic freedom, and they've provided, without any doubt, the greatest source for inspiration, or at least of inspiration, for art, for literature, and for music. That is the meaning of Paul's words when he talks about being light, living out differently. And did you notice what Paul added to this as he writes to the church? Do this without complaining and arguing. Now, the Greek word he uses here that we translate as complaining is it's kind of a rare word. It only appears three times in the New Testament. Its biggest use in the Old Testament, um, this was the word that was used um, for the complaining that was done by the Israelites against Moses during those 40 years in the desert. Complaining that eventually kept the generation, that generation, out of the promised land. So Paul gives the warning not to engage in that type of complaining or that type of behaving. He says that we are, we are to work out our salvation for the purpose of coming together collectively as a church, bringing the collective power and influence of our resources and gifts and talents and, pas and passions, not getting up tied up in complaining about things or arguing about really petty, small, trivial things. That just sidelines the mission, drains energy from the mission, and takes the focus away from the mission. That's why Paul adds a few words to, the, to what he's saying. Look at verse six, uh, 16b. Do this in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor 
for nothing. He's saying, do this, so that one day when I stand before God and I give my account of my leadership, my apostleship, my investment in you, it has not been for nothing. In, in what we find here is Paul's, Paul has got very much a, a wartime mentality. We are in the middle of such a great spiritual conflict that there is no time for trivial stuff. For Paul, the day was too dark, the time was too short, the need too great to do anything but to go into full mission mode and take the gospel. And he's saying, if you've got time to be worrying about the small stuff, he says, then you're obviously not in the game. Then Paul writes up, I mean, ends up, wraps up the section with a personal note. After saying that he wants his life investment to them to come to full fruition, he writes this, verse 17. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. This is quite mind-boggling what he's saying. As we discussed at the beginning of this series, Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians while in prison, and he doesn't know if he's going to be alive or if he's going to die. So here he says, I don't know what's going to happen with me, but I know that you're doing okay. I know that you are working out your salvation. I know that you're going to shine like stars in the night. I know that you're going to stay unified and focused on the mission. And if I end up being killed for planting you as a church, leading you as your pastor, or serving Christ as an apostle, then so be it. It's a life well lived. So be glad for me. Remember, for me to live, to die, is gain. Okay, let's bring this to a closing moment. Isn't it true that most of us live for success, for status, for social position? Isn't that the world, isn't it what the world kind of drives us into? But according to what the Bible says, what this book says, the ultimate life is orientated not so much around success, status, social position, but around sacrifice. And when you stop for a moment to think about the things that really matter in life, doesn't a life sacrificed to a greater good stir something in you? Something that is far more meaningful than self? Knowing that you can live a life that will make a difference, a real difference? It's almost like a distant voice calling to be the best and to be involved in the transformation that God is bringing to this world. Now, most of us, if not all of us, are familiar with the name of John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement. Let me read to you something he wrote, and he simply called his covenant prayer to God. And the words will be up in the screen as well. This is not something that was meant to be public, um, but it was found with his papers after his death. He made a private pact with God. He eyes his words. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low by you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine, I am yours, so be it. And the covenant which I've made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. The power of a life, of this kind of life, is almost unmeasurable. 
And Wesley lived and dreamed of others would come and join him and change society. In fact, here's one of the things that he wrote in one of his letters. Give me 100 men who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and they alone will shake the gates of hell and set the kingdom of heaven upon earth. And that's the challenge of Paul, not only for the Philippians, not only for Wesley, but for each one of us. To live out our salvation in such a way, not complaining, not moaning, but in such a way that we are lights that influence our world, bringing salvation to people, but also changing our society. And surely, it has to be worth living for that. Father, thank you that as we look in Scripture, Christianity is not a set of rules and do's and don'ts, but rather just being part of your plans for this world. And thank you that you call us to to be involved in that and to be used by you in transforming our society. And my prayer for myself and for us as a church, Lord, is that we would never lose sight of that, the call that you've placed upon us. So give us the courage, give us the boldness, give us the commitment to be the people of God in this area that make a real, real difference for you and for your kingdom. And that's what I pray for in Jesus' name. Amen.